Our great God in heaven, we thank you very much for our Bible study tonight. Thank you because you are bringing us to the conclusion of the first epistle of Peter. We pray, O Lord, that tonight your spirit will be with us as he has always been with us. And we pray, O Lord, that you open our spiritual eyes, that we'll see wondrous, wonderful things out of your word in Jesus' name. We pray that those of us who hear your word today will be strengthened and established and edified by the teaching of your word in Jesus' name. The word we need, the encouragement we need, the strength we need for the hour and for the day and for whatever anybody may be going through, grant to everyone in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, as we become stronger in the study of your word, we become more equipped, more effective in the ministry towards people around us in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Tonight, we come to the study of the Word of God once again. And it's a joy to know that as we started in the first epistle of Peter, the Lord has systematically and gradually, slowly, week after week, brought us now to the very conclusion and the end of the epistle. I need to remind you, though, that as we have been in the epistle of Peter, we have seen what he's been talking about. He looks at the believers in their surroundings, and he saw them in an hostile world. And yet, as he saw them with the hostility around them, he wanted to bring them hope. Not only that they should have hope, they should be happy in the world in which they were living as they were walking in their pilgrim journey. Not only that they'll just be happy, he wanted to show them how they'll be holy. That's why from chapter 1 he said, you have hope of the inheritance that will come. Not only that, he wanted to show that you should be holy even as our Father in heaven is holy, as God who has called us is holy. And then he devoted some part of the epistle to making sure that we Christians will live in harmony, one among the other. And also in the family, that you have hope, you ought to be holy in your personal life, and then there should be harmony as you relate one with another. And he has followed through on the theme that he wanted uh, to talk about. He talked about salvation and salvation in the Lord. And then he talked about suffering. And then he talked about our submission. Submission in society, submission in the home, submission in the church, submission one to another. Last week, we saw as he was uh, concluding that area of submission, when he said, ye younger, submit one to another, submit yourselves to the elders. Yea, he says, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. Now he comes to the very conclusion of what has been going through. And he wants to assure us now that in the warfare of life, that we can be triumphant. As we look at uh, the, uh, the verses uh, before us today, and there are many people that may just come to these verses in the conclusion of the epistle and jump over some of the verses because they feel that one maybe was just there for the people of that time. But you remember what Paul had assured us in the word of the Lord in Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God, that's referring to every believer, every saint in Christ, every child of God, that the man of God, a child of God, may be perfect, thoroughly furnished, developed, matured, equipped unto all good works. That's why in our church here, we have this systematic, expository study of the word of God. Not omitting anything. Not thinking that maybe that's not relevant, that's not important, that's not applicable. We look at everything, we read everything. As we look at this, we find that everything we look at in the word of God is very important, very necessary to our understanding of the full gospel. And so in these verses, Peter reminds us that the Christian is in a spiritual warfare in the world here. And he instructs us how we're going to be victorious over sin. How we become triumphant in suffering. How we become effective in resisting Satan until he flees 
from us. I want you to look at this first Peter chapter 5, reading verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, that means your enemy, that means your opposer, the devil, as a running lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. That's why he tells us that Christians, I've been writing to you, you are scattered all over Asia Minor. And you look at the unbelievers around as, uh, you know, they are the adversaries. They are the people that really do not want you to make spiritual progress. And they want to oppose you, persecute you, and they make you pass through fairy trial. But you know what? The real arch enemy, and the one you really need to overcome, is the devil. That's your adversary. And is the one that you are going to resist steadfast in the faith. In fact, you should know that the same affliction are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. It's not peculiar to you. This thought of warfare in a Christian life. Would you know that that was not peculiar to Peter? Because Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Reading from verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. We do not do battle after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strong holes. There he tells us, yes, there's a warfare. Yes, there's hostility in the world. Yes, there is a devil out there. Anywhere you are that tries to confront you and oppose you and persecute you and set up all things around so that you'll not be able to make the progress you thought you'll make. But we have a spiritual weapon casting down imaginations on every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So he tells us that uh, there is a warfare and in that warfare we do you overcome? As was writing to Timothy in First Timothy chapter 1. There in verse 18, once again, he wanted Timothy not just to relax and not just to close his eyes, fold his arms, and feel that all is all right. I'm saved and sanctified spirit field. I'm on my way to heaven. There is a warfare. First Timothy chapter 1 verse 18. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on you, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. And you understand then what the Lord is telling us and teaching us as we look at all this, that uh, there, is, uh, there is a war. In fact, the world will fight against your Christian faith. The flesh will fight against your Christian faith. And all circumstances orchestrated by Satan, the devil, the adversary, will fight against your Christian faith. And you better know what we're given in the scriptures, how you'll be able to overcome. In First Peter chapter 2, verse 11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you, as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly laws which war against the soul. So then you, you have understanding now that as you look at the scriptures, there is warfare, the devil fighting, the flesh fighting, and the world fighting. And then how are you going to overcome? In all these uh, verses we're going to look at today, uh, Peter pointed out, number one, the attitude of the Christian warrior. What's the attitude of the Christian warrior? In First Peter chapter 5, verse 8, be sober, be vigilant. That's after you have cast all your care upon him, knowing that he cares for you. Number one, then, the attitude of the Christian warrior. And because we are to watch, we are to be sober, we are to be vigilant and be on the alert, so that we keep on trusting in God, casting all our cares upon him, and then we'll be able to overcome. Then he tells us the, the, the identity of the enemy. That's number two. It says the adversary of the Christian warrior. The adversary of the Christian warrior, it tells us in the middle part of that verse 8, because your adversary, that's the adversary, that's the enemy, the devil, as a running lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. It tells us that the real trouble and the one we really need to fight against and overcome is the devil. Number three points out the admonition for a Christian warrior. He admonishes us, he instructs us how we can resist and how we can be steadfast in the faith. He says, whom resists steadfast in the faith. 
That's the teaching. That's the admonition. That's the thing that makes us victorious, knowing that uh, the same affliction, uh, afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. That's why it tells us there are associates of a Christian warrior. You are not alone. Many times when you face persecution, many times when you go through trouble and trial, and you think nobody knows what you are going through. You are going through all this alone. In fact, you wonder whether in Christian history, Anybody from the time of Abel to the time of Enoch and the time of Joseph and the time of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and the time of John the Baptist and the time of Paul, you know that they went through some things, but you wonder whether anybody ever went through something like you are going through. It tells you you are not alone. You have the associate of the Christian warrior where it tells us the same afflictions, similar kind of affliction. Similar kind of things we are going through are accomplished in your brethren that are in other parts of the world. But then he tells us it's not for joke, it's not in vain, it's not for nothing. There is the number five, the advancement of the Christian warrior. And that, that's the goal, that's the purpose, that's why God allows all those things. He's watching in his wonder working power. He could have removed all those things. Why didn't he remove them? Because there's an advancement. There is something waiting for you. That's why he didn't remove them. Look at verse 10 by the God of all grace. Who has called us unto his eternal glory by Jesus Christ after that he has suffered for a while. Make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. And so Peter, a very, very practical, telling us that there's warfare. And the warfare in the world gets us to be able to advance in the Christian faith. We're not going to look in depth. In all these verses we have superficially looked at. Number one, we divide the study into three parts. Number one, preservation from the power of Satan. Preservation from the power of Satan. Number two, the process of perfection through suffering. The process of perfection through suffering. And then number three, that's the last part, the last verses of the epistle, Peter's pastoral salutation. Let's come back to number one. We're reading now from First Peter chapter 5, verses 7, 8, and 9. Casting all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, your enemy, the devil, as a running lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom receives steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Now it shows us very clearly there, there is preservation for the child of God from the power of Satan. But then it tells us how we are going to have that preservation. How we're going to have the protection of the Lord. That in the midst of it all, you'll still be able to make progress in your Christian life with all the hostility of the world around you. With all the opposition of Satan leveled against you. And with all the demonic forces orchestrated by the arch enemy, the devil, against your life, you can be preserved. You can be protected. And you can make progress in your Christian life. How do you do that? Peter says, you cast all your care upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. That means, whatsoever, tri whatever trials we're going through, and whatever burdens we bear, the believer is to totally commit himself to the Lord and cast all his cares upon the Lord. And in Psalm 55, open your Bible, Psalm 55, reading there in verse 22. Here is what the psalmist is saying. And you must know that the psalmist passed through quite a lot. Maybe you'll never be able to pass through, or you'll never actually be allowed to pass through a fraction of what he passed through. But in all the things he passed through, he cast all his cares upon the Lord. I cannot begin to tell you the details of the burden, of the trial, of the trouble, of the tribulation he had when he was in this world. And yet he overcame, and he successfully ended his uh, journey. It tells us in verse 22, cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never, he shall never suffer, permit, allow the righteous to be moved. 
that means then, as the psalmist did, he counseled other people, admonished other people. That's what they are to do. And that is what you are to do as well. Isn't that, uh, you know, how we sing in our songbook number one? It says, uh, over there, is there a heart there? Overboarding by sorrow? Is there a life weighed down by care? Come to the cross. Each body bearing all your anxiety, all your care, all your worry, all your trouble, all your body, leave it there. All your anxiety, all your care. Bring it to the mercy seat. It says, leave it there. I remember, it says, never a body they cannot bear. Never a friend like Jesus. You, you remember, uh, number four, in our songbook, leave it there, leave it there. Take your body to the Lord and leave it there. If you trust and you never doubt, he will surely bring you through and bring you out. Instead of breaking up, instead of breaking down, you'll be able to break through. Take your bodies to the Lord, leave it there. That's what Peter is telling us. You take those bodies to the Lord, don't break up, don't break down, break through. So that as you leave your body to the Lord, everything now is totally given to the Lord. That's how we're able to overcome in Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, reading there in verse 7, it tells us that and the God of peace and the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. How will that happen? Because you obey verse 6, being careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. You do not allow the sorrows and the cares and the problems and the agonies of the world around you to weigh you down. Don't you remember the promise of God? He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. That's why you can confidently say, the Lord is my help. Look at it in Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have and to what he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear what man shall do unto me. And that's exactly what Peter was telling them. And that's what the Holy Spirit is telling us. Through the epistle we're looking at today, there's nothing for you to fear. And there is nothing for you to tremble at. Because the Lord is watching over you. The Lord is watching over your life. He will see you through. And you'll come out fine on the other side of the stormy sea in Jesus' name. And so it tells us what the attitude ought to be in Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, reading there some selected verses, uh, telling them as, he, also as uh, Peter was telling uh, the, the, the readers of his epistle, were to be sober, and the sobriety is for every part of the church. Uh, Titus chapter 2 verse 2, that the aged men be sober. The aged men be sober in verse 4, that they teach, that they may teach the young women to be sober, even the women too, that to be sober. Verse 6, uh, young men likewise exhort to be sober minded. And so you will see then, the sobriety is for everyone in verse 12, teaching us the denying of godliness and worldly laws, we should live soberly. Uh, you know that you, you are living in a world that is uh, filled with evil. A world that doesn't want you to remain pure and to remain totally uh, in, the, in the hands of the Lord, in the holy of his hand. That's why it says, be sober. That's why it says, you will not be frivolous in your Christian life. You'll be very thoughtful in your Christian life. You'll be very deliberate in your Christian life. You'll be very vigilant in your Christian life. Watch and pray that you do not fall into temptation. Because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. But then it gives us assurance. If we will do what the Lord wants us to do, in I'm coming back now to First Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom receives steadfast in the faith. It says, you must resist the devil. And that's something you must do. But please understand that the devil is not always the ugly uh, person. Especially uh, in appearance that uh, many people think about. But you understand, according to the word of God, sometimes he can even transform himself 
to look like like uh, an angel of light in uh, second corinthians chapter 11 second corinthians chapter 11 verse 14 and no marvel for satan himself is transformed into an angel of light and when he wants to deceive he can do that and sometimes he goes about if he knows that you know as a running lion if he roars on you then you'll be afraid and you drop all your weapons and then you surrender you submit to him if he knows that that is a weapon that will work in your life he'll do that if he knows that that may not work that is just to come around transform himself like an angel of light so that he can still accomplish his aim his goal of bringing your christian life down that he will do that's why you need to be sober that's why you need to watch but then it says as we do that we must know that he is seeking whom he may devour that word devour it means to crush it means to destroy and eventually to swallow up and totally possess that individual but let me help you and break it down a little bit so that you will see the steps that he takes before eventually he gets there we don't have the time to go through all the references but number one he deceives he comes and then he deceives he might ask something like an innocent question that will make you doubt your conviction and where you stood upon number one he deceives number two he tries to defile he defiles your mind he defiles your conscience he defiles your heart and he defiles everything number three he's doing all that so that you yourself will be defeated he tries to defeat you with all those arrows with all those stars deceiving defiling defeating eventually he derails you you've been going on this path and he knows that if you continue on that path you're on your way to heaven and he doesn't want you to go to heaven because he's lost it he wants you to lose it you therefore he wants to derail you number five he wants to debar you he even forget the promises of god now he makes you to forget your right your right before the throne the privilege you have the opportunity you have to be able to get the grace of god abundant grace of god in your life which is sufficient for you he debars you he limits you he restrains your mind he focuses you on other things to debar you from claiming your right number six he deforms you your christian life is not what it used to be again it deforms you it deforms your understanding it deforms even your appearance it deforms everything and then number seven is goal now in deceiving you in defiling you in defeating you derailing you debarring you and deforming you is to destroy is to destroy because jesus christ said i am come that she might have life and i'll be eating abundance but he has come the thief so that he will be able to kill and to steal and to destroy and so peter tells us that that devil you know what he's doing as a running lion is walking about is seeking whom he may devour he wants to destroy but thank god he will not destroy you i said he will not destroy you because we're told in first john first john chapter 3 reading there in verse 8 in verse 8 he that committed sin is of the devil for the devil sinner from the beginning listen to this now for the son but for this purpose the son of god was manifested that he was that he might destroy destroy what the works of the devil all the works of the devil no matter what direction it comes from will be removed out of your life in jesus name the lord can do it he has given victory to other people he will give you victory in first john chapter 4 verse 4 ye have got little children and have overcome them we will overcome i said we will overcome because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world who is the one in the world that's our adversary that's the running lion that's the one that is walking about seeking whom he may devour if you are born again and christ is living within you you can overcome because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world in first john chapter 5 verse 18 we know that whosoever whosoever is born of god sinneth not but he that is begotten of god uh, keepeth himself and that wicked one toucheth him not 
touches him not, he will not be able to touch you. And we know that we are God, and the whole world lies in wickedness. That means then we can overcome. And so keep on trusting in the Lord, in the blood of the Lamb that was shed for you. Victory is certain and sure for everyone. Revelation chapter 12, reading there in verse 9, and a great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. In verse 11, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the dead. That is, when you focus on Christ, and you say, I don't care what the devil does, I don't care if you're seeking to devour me or seeking to devour other Christians, but I know the Lord is on my side. The promises of the Lord are for me. You'll find those promises to be yes and amen. And you'll be victorious in Jesus' name. That's why it says in uh, chapter, in uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, telling us very clearly there that his system receives steadfast in the faith. We're not to run away. Run away from the devil. Run away from the problems. We are to resist the devil. And then it says, if you resist him in faith, relying on the spiritual weapon that the Lord has given us, it says, instead of you free him, it's the devil that will flee from you. In James chapter 4, verse 7, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. And it will do what? It will flee from you. We come to point number 2. The process of perfection through suffering. The process of perfection through suffering. You, you must have been wondering if you have been persecuted. Why all this in your life? Well, you don't need to search uh, far for the reason. The reason why God has allowed all those things is so that He will start and He will continue the process of perfection in your life. He has an image in mind. It's like uh, when you are refining gold or you are refining some precious metal. You pass that metal through the fire and you melt that thing. It is a fire that will melt that thing so that you will be able to mold that thing into the image or the structure that you want the thing to be. That's why the Lord has allowed that in your life because he has a good purpose, because he has a good reason, because he has a good thing he wants to accomplish. Look at it in verse 10, but the God of all grace who has called us to his, unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after that he has suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, Settle you. Uh, you don't meet many Christians, uh, probably almost all the Christians. And uh, this is what they want. They want to be perfect, make you perfect, establish you. They want to be established, established in the faith, established in the ministry, established in the good, in the word the Lord has for them. Strengthen you. They want to be strong with the might of the Lord and say to you, they want to be so planted in the court, in the house of the Lord, that any flood, any wind, anything will not be able to shake them. They want to be like that oak tree that is solidly planted on the top of the mountain. And no matter the storm and no matter the rain will not be able to shake or move them totally, completely settle. Well, that's the goal. That's what they want. What they do not think, what they do not understand is that there is something that leads there. There is something that makes you to have that establishment, accomplishment, or that perfection that you are dreaming about. It says, the God of all grace, who has called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, he will allow some suffering, some trial, he will allow some, some temptation, he will allow some things that appear negative, but the whole purpose is so that eventually you will be perfected. And that's what happened even to the Son of God in Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. Verse 10. For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of our salvation perfect through sufferings. If he allowed it for Christ, if he did it for Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, what do you see about yourself as well? He made him perfect through suffering. 
Well, it clears up something in your mind. Sometimes you're, you're a believer, a real child of God, and you are passing through some things you don't understand. Then you are questioning, have you seen? Have you backsliding? Have you done evil? Is all this happening to you? Is this the punishment of your sin? No, it may not be. That the Lord has forgiven you, that you are the beloved of the Lord, that you are a real child of God, you are walking to please the Lord, doesn't mean that He will not allow some of these things in your life. He allowed it in the life of Jesus Christ. So that Jesus Christ, in His human form, He will be perfected through suffering. So then, don't let the devil confuse you. Uh, the devil will say, you are going through that because maybe all your sins have not been forgiven. Maybe you are not totally saved. Maybe you are not genuinely saved. You remember that thing that happened this, this and this. That's what you are going through now. That's what some people have said about Paul the Apostle. They said, you know Paul the Apostle, he persecuted the believers. And because he persecuted the believers, even though he was born again, all the sins were forgiven. He was redeemed. He suffered a lot thereafter. Because of what he had done before, no, that's not it. The reason is given in the word of God. Because he said he had a son in the flesh. He had a persecution. All those Jews in the synagogues, all those some believers on the street, everywhere looking for him, wanting to destroy him. And then he went to the Lord. He said, remove those from me. And the Lord said, no. And then second time, no. Third time, no. The Lord said, I'm giving you that because of the great revelations. Not because your sins are not forgiven. Not because I'm still punishing you. Because of the sins you committed in the past. Not because the redemption the Lord has given you is not perfect. Just to keep you humble. And then it says, my grace is sufficient for you. When Paul the Apostle understood that it was not because of any sin, that's why he said, then he was rejoicing. Look at it in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Look at his attitude now in verse 9. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory. In my infirmities are the power of Christ, my trust upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecution, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. What you understood is what you also need to understand. That the Lord is allowing those things in your life so that the process of perfection will not be hindered in your life. We we'll come back to Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 5, still reading about the Lord Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 5, reading verses 8 and 9. Though he were a son, capital S, the very son of God, the beloved son of God, yet he learned obedience by the things that which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them. That obey him. So then please understand that those things have a purpose in your life. Uh, the, the persecution and the trouble and the trial. In Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12, reading there from verse 7. Hebrews 12, verse 7. If ye endure chastening, and that chastening will come in various ways, endure it. God dealeth with you. As were well sons, for what son is he whom the father chastineth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Think about that. It says you are in the family of God, and in that family of God uh, there will be rebuke, there will be chastisement, there will be suffering, there will be persecution, uh, there will be some negative things that come against your flesh, not against your spirit, against your flesh. And as the flesh is humbled and humiliated and brought down, then the spirit and the soul is increasing so that the outward part is decaying and going out, that the inner man may grow. That's what the Lord does. That's what he permits for all his children. 
It says, if you do not allow that to happen, then you are, you are not a child of God. And you know, and there are some people, that's exactly the reason why some people say, I don't think I can stay in this church again. I want to be in a particular church where there, there will be no persecution and the people of the world will love me and everything will be all right and there will be no suffering at all. Listen, if you ever found such a church and you went to such a church, no problem, no trial, no persecution, no suffering, everything is just the way you want, you will not be a real son. Because the way he deals with all his children, with all his sons, is that he permits all that to bring them to perfection. He allowed it for Jesus Christ, the only begotten son. He allowed it for Paul, the greatest of the apostles. He allowed it for all the other apostles. He allowed it for people in the Old Testament and the New Testament. If he doesn't permit it, allow it for you, then it says you are not sons. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, there are people that, uh, that will say, if this were a good church, I will not be having any problem at all. You think so? The, uh, the early church was a good church. There was persecution. And the church of the New Testament, as you look at all the epistles, that those were good churches. They had persecution. Chastisement is not only suffering and persecution. Chastisement is even rebuke and correction and discipline and you, you know some people that have that feeling that you know in our church here if you put your leg here you are disciplined if you put your mouth there you are disciplined if you put your hand there you are disciplined i want to look for another church a church where there is no discipline where you can do whatever you want to do anytime you want to do it however you want to do it and nobody will say why did you do that you shouldn't have done that i want to get to a church where there is no church discipline if you ever found such a church and you went to that church and you remained in that church and for the rest of your life there is no chastisement there is no discipline anymore that's the wrong place to be because it says chastisement, church discipline is for your good. See it again in that first age. But if ye be without chastisement, without church discipline, whereof all our partakers, don't we have that experience in our families? We rebuke our children. We correct our children. That's a good family. But a family where the children do anything they want to do, anytime they want to do it, and there is no rebuke, no discipline, no chastisement, that's not a good family. It says, where of all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have, we have had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us, and we give them reverence, shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live for the very little for a few days, chastened us after their own pleasure? But he, for our profit, for our profit, for our profit, he says that we might be partakers of his holiness. That's the reason why you understand if you look back at your life and there, there are things uh, you know you did in the past which you wouldn't do now. You know why? Because the Lord chastised you. Maybe you did it directly. Maybe you used the church. Maybe you used the pastor or the leadership in the church. Or maybe you used whatever it is so that you were chastised and you said, I'll never try that again once this is over. That's the purpose of God. That's the plan of God. It says that ye might be partakers of his uh, holiness. And that's why we need to allow the Lord that he will himself, he will chastise us when he needs to. He will correct us when he needs to. And then we'll be partakers of, of holiness. We'll be partakers of his righteousness. We'll be perfected as a result of the chastisement. Of course, it's not going to be something that you enjoy. Rebuke, correction, reprove, discipline is not something we love. The flesh doesn't love it, but it's good for you. It's like medicine when, when you swallow that thing, it's bitter. And we don't like the medicine, but we need it for our health. In verse 11, now no chast not chastening, for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, unto what it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. And so we know that God has a purpose in permitting all those things. Uh, Peter was telling the uh, persecuted Christians as he wrote to them, 
that God has called them to glory. And they will impart all necessary and needful grace in their suffering. So that instead of being weakened and destroyed by the persecution and suffering, they will be strengthened. They will be established. They will be matured. They will be perfected. When God's grace comes before the trial. And it comes beneath the trial. And it comes side by side beside a trial. And it's following after behind a trial. And it's coming in between the trials. A trial comes now. And the grace of God surrounds that trial before behind, beside, beneath, and it even comes between the trials, between the first trial and the second trial, and it comes beyond the trials, of course, of course, you are going to be perfected, and the point is, when you take all those trials, and you do not allow the grace of God to come before it, beneath it, beside it, behind it, between it, beyond it, you do not allow the grace of God to intermingle with the trials, that's when we do not receive good from the trials but then if you allow the grace of God to do its work you'll be developed you'll be matured you'll be perfected even in the midst of all those afflictions and trials Christians who have suffered for their Christian conviction they tend to be strong they tend to be firm they tend to be immovable and they tend to be settled and like a solid house which is firmly fixed on a foundation that cannot be shaken by winds or floods. You find that those believers, now they can do what they couldn't do before. In Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Here is the testimony of somebody who has gone through a trial. In chapter 4 verse 13. I can do all things through Christ which strengthened me. You think he just came to that? He didn't say that at the beginning, but he was saved, he was sanctified, he was filled with the Holy Ghost. That wasn't the end when those trials came. And if you want to read about the trials, go through chapter 6 of, uh, of Second Corinthians and see the things that he went through and then go through other parts of the epistles and see what he went through. Then he could say, that thing is working in me. That thing is accomplishing something. It's settling me, establishing me, perfecting me, and it's making me the kind of person I want to be. Then he announced to the Philippians, Philippians, you know what? Now I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. That's the very purpose of allowing persecution in our lives. And I pray that if you have gone through any persecution at all, this purpose of the Lord will be fulfilled in your life in Jesus' name. Now we come to point number three, Peter's pastoral salutation. In uh, this pastoral salutation, I'm reading now from verse 11. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. It's talking about the Lord, the God of all grace. The God of all grace that has this perfecting work, establishing work, strengthening work, settling work in our lives. It says to him, be glory and dominion forever and and ever and now the salutation by Silvanus that does the same name as Silas a faithful brother unto you as I suppose I have written briefly exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God we are wherein he stand he said uh, Silas that means Silvanus uh, the same thing is me with me here and as he has been with me here, he has uh, been uh, instrumental in uh, even uh, uh, copying uh, what I have uh, written. And then he's bringing it unto you. And then uh, you need to know something about Silas. This Silas, he was with Paul the Apostle. Not only that he was with Paul the Apostle, he has also, as we have seen, he had been with Peter as well. And these Silas have been found faithful, a faithful brother. He had the grace of God in his life that whoever he was working with, it didn't matter. That wherever he was, it didn't matter. He was still found faithful and loyal and trustworthy and dependable. That's a saying that you'll be the testimony concerning us that we like Silas. Whether you are with us in the state here or you are transferred to another state or you go to another nation as we found you dependable here, the people over there, they will know that the testimonies we had about you is a true testimony. That as we found you faithful, they too they will find you faithful. Anywhere you find yourself, you live that Christian life with Paul or with Peter. It's the same thing. You are focusing attention on Christ and you are living 
proud of the Lord. And then he tells us in verse 13, the church which is at Babylon, elect, elected together with you, saluted you. So does Marcus, my son. Here we find that there was a church at Babylon. Which means then that no matter how polluted, how defiled, how corrupt, how dirty a society might be, we can still have a church there. That's why we don't accept that, you know, there's such a locality, there's such a district, there's such a zone that is so corrupt, that is so bad, and the idolatry there, the prostitution there is so much, you cannot have a district church there. Yes, you can have. Because even in Babylon, there's a church there. It says, the church at Babylon salutes you. And then it says, they are elect together with you. The same grace you have, the same salvation you have, these, uh, this church in Babylon, they have that same grace as well. How did they have the peace of God? How did they have the grace of God in their lives? It's because of the work, the justifying work of the atonement of Christ. In uh, Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, we're reading verse 2, back up to verse 1 for proper understanding. Therefore, be justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein ye will stand and receive and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Here he tells us, because of faith, we're justified. Not only that, by the grace of God, we're now standing. And it's because of that, we're rejoicing in that grace. Rejoicing in that grace. Because you see, you are saved by grace. Then you stand by grace. Then you find the grace of God sufficient for you in all that you may go through. We've read it once. Let's read it again. In Second Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, reading there in verse 9. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for you, saved by grace, standing by grace, and the sufficiency of the grace of God being with you every time, whatever it is you may be going through. That grace should never leave your life. In fact, if a person is going to grow, it's going to be by the grace of the Lord. In Second Peter chapter 3, Second Peter chapter 3, reading there in verse 18, but grow in grace. And in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be glory both now and forever. Amen. It says, grow in grace. Uh, you say, that's exactly what I want. And I've been trying to see how I can, how I can grow in grace. Can, can you tell me how I can grow in grace? It tells you right there, in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The more you know about the love of Christ, the more you know about the mercy of God, the more you know about what God has accomplished through Christ, and the more you appropriate that. The knowledge you have becomes applied knowledge. And you apply that word of God to yourself. What you know about Christ. Who Christ is. And who he is to you. What he can do in your life. And you appropriate that. You will be growing in the grace of the Lord. Of course it also means. You are going to spend some time in prayer. In Hebrews chapter 4. Verse 16. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace. Let us pray then. Let us come boldly. Let us intercede. Let us demand of the Lord. Coming boldly with confidence and with faith unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's how you are going to grow in grace. Number one, in the knowledge of the Lord. Number two, not only the knowledge of the Lord, in prayer as well. Communing with the Lord, praying unto the Lord. So that no matter what you go through, no matter what you are passing through, the hand of the Lord will be with you. The peace of the Lord will be with you. In John chapter 14. John chapter 14, verse 27. John 14, 27. Here the Lord was assuring his own disciples. He said uh, in verse 27 that uh, peace I live with you. My peace I give unto you. It's this uh, communion, intimate fellowship, relationship with the Lord that gives that peace of God in your heart and life. Not as the world giveth, 
giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let each be afraid. In chapter 16 of that same John, verse 33. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. You see that? If you are going to have peace, you listen to the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord that is given unto you, so that in this life, you will be able to have the peace of God reigning in your heart. Then he assures us, you know, the Lord has not deceived us. He has not left us in darkness. He says in the world, he shall have tribulation. That's what we are talking about. It's an hostile world. The trials are there. The tribulations are there. And the difficulties are there. It's a testing time actually. And then it says, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And then in Philippians now chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, reading there in verse 7, telling us the extent that the peace of God will go in our lives. Understand, the grace and the peace of God are linked and associated together. When you have the grace of God, it increases the peace of God in your life. You abide in grace, and then you abide in peace, you grow in grace, you grow in the peace of the Lord as well. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, and the peace of God which passes all understanding. That means you can't analyze it. You can't understand it. It's so deep, it's so wide, you are immersed in it, and in fact sometimes you even pinch yourself, everything is serene within. Because you are resting. It's a fulfillment of the word of the Lord. Come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So take his yoke upon you and your land of him, because he is lowly and he is meek. And you will find rest for yourself, for my yoke is easy, and my body is light. When you really come to the Lord, you are resting in him, you are relying on him. Then the peace of God that passes all analysis, all comprehension, all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And so then, it means that you so submit yourself to the Lord and you are able to stand in the grace of God. And you are able to stand in the peace of God as well. Please come back to First Peter chapter 5. As we come to the conclusion of the epistle, it tells us the kind of world in which we have been living. And yet, it tells us from uh, the beginning to the very end, it says, you can still live the victorious life. Others have lived the victorious life. In fact, Christ has made all necessary provisions so that you can live the victorious life because it's greater than your enemy. It's greater than all the trials. It's greater than all the persecution. Anything you may be going through, you say, that's what I'm looking for. How can I have that victory casting? All your care upon him. For he careth for you. And even though you cast all the cares upon him, don't be careless. Because I've cast all my cares upon him, doesn't call me to a life of frivolity and a life of carelessness. Be sober and be vigilant. Be watching. And don't be interested. Don't be a busybody in the matters of other people. You have enough trouble to think about. Enough trial, enough temptation to face and to overcome. Be sober and be vigilant. You know why? If you are looking at things belonging to other people, don't you know there is a devil, there is an adversary. Your, your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walking about, seeking. The careless people, the indolent people, the prayerless people, the people that are not taking the practical word of God, applying it to their lives, seeking whom he may deliver, resist him, steadfast in the faith. And understand, other people are in the world over there. Believers like you and I, by the grace of God, they are overcoming. The grace of God in their lives can make us overcome to you. The same things, afflictions that are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But now the God of all grace. Grace in your trial, grace in the difficulty, grace during persecution, any period of your life, the God of all grace. After, it says, who has called you to glory, and he has called us to virtue. It says in other parts, but Jesus Christ, after that he has suffered a while, he will make you perfect. I said he will make you perfect, and establish you, and strengthen you, and settle you. You can be perfect. The Lord can make you perfect. He will do it. The peace of God be with everyone in Christ Jesus. Let's rise up and pray. Don't think about others. Think about yourself. 
The Lord loves you. Whatever you are going through, the Lord has not abandoned you. It's not because of, you know, you are such a terrible sinner. No, don't let the devil confuse you. You are a child of God. You are born again. You are sanctified. All those problems there, it's not because God is angry with you that he allows all those things. It's so that he can perfect you. So that he can establish you. So that he can strengthen you. So you just pray and tell the Lord, in all my trials and tribulations and problems, strengthen me. Establish me. Settle me. Perfect me. He will do it. He will do it. His grace is available to whosoever will come. As you get more knowledge about the mercy of God, about the love of Christ in your life. His grace will be sufficient for you. His grace will work in your life. And then you come to the point where you can say with Paul the Apostle, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. When you became a new believer, you had great, great aspirations. I'll do this for God. I'll do this for God. I'll do this for God. Now in your little, little trouble, you are so pedaling, you are back pedaling. I don't think I can do that again. I don't think I'm capable anymore. Yes, you are capable in the Lord. You can. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. But I, about all these my troubles. Yes, that's one of the instruments the Lord is using. That's one of the tools the Lord is using to perfect you and make you fit for the great things you have promised the Lord you will do. Don't break up. Don't break out. Don't break down. Break through. In the grace of the Lord.